flip Bitch, I'm in the building like a Jew Flight boss, bitch, yeah, I'm golly in the spirit Doing mental gymnastics, my karate esoteric, yeah Why are you lost? Why are you lost? What do you follow? You unfulfilled, that's how you know her voice is so hollow Well, I was born in, uh, in Egypt in 1948 uh, in the city of Alexandria. Uh, but I'll say immediately, although with great sorrow, I'm not an Egyptian. A lot of people assume automatically that if you're born in Egypt, you're Egyptian. The sad thing about Egypt is that you're always a non-Egyptian if you're not by blood, which is a problem, but never mind. I'm born from a family uh, of my father's side were Belgians. They immigrated to Egypt in the 1890s. And my mother's side, Maltese. Uh, Alexandria had a very, very large foreign community, about a quarter of a million in the, uh, the post-war, in the 1940s, 50s. Big cosmopolitan city. It has always been a cosmopolitan city uh, from the day of its foundation by Alexander the Great. But it regenerated itself in the uh, in the pre-war days, uh, mainly because of the establishment of the modern Egyptian state after the Napoleonic invasion, and uh, <coughs> many many foreigners came to settle there. I'm three generations in Egypt, and uh, so I grew up there and uh, went to school there and went to an English school. I left when I was 19, and I went to. England. I first with a little stop in Switzerland where my brother was living and I came to complete my studies uh, which took me till 1973. Uh, in those days in my family you either became an architect or an engineer. It was the route that we took. Uh, I decided to go into construction engineering. I did it at the uh, South Bank Polytechnic in London. And that's it, you know, I was ready to, to do a career in, in the construction industry. Which, uh, in, in a curious way, I found myself taking overseas jobs. Partly because I wanted to travel and partly because I spoke languages. I spoke Arabic fluently, so it was easy for me in those days. It was a big boom uh, in the building industry in the, in the Middle East, the oil boom. and. Uh, so it was easy to get good jobs and uh, I started off with going to Oman I were there for five years uh, eventually I found myself in, in Saudi Arabia uh, on a very senior posting I was 33 at the time and quite frankly minding my own business uh, in Egyptology I mean I had it wasn't my thing at all I had a avocation like everybody else I got interested I read books about the pyramids but uh, that's about it uh, until, until, uh, as things happen. I call it my, uh, uh, although I don't, I don't compare myself to, to, uh, to Isaac Newton, uh, I still call it the apple that fell on my head. And I'm a great believer that things occur all the time, uh, but we just don't pay attention. Uh, 
everybody knows about the apple that fell on Newton's head. I don't know if it's a true story or not, but but it, it typifies the the reaction of one man who asked the right question: Why did it fall? I, I happened to go to Egypt from Saudi Arabia to visit uh, my mother who was still living there, and uh, I took a a diversion before going to Alexandria, I went to the Cairo Museum. You know, when you live in Egypt, you just don't do these things, you know. It's, uh, tourists go and see the pyramids, not the Egyptians. <laughs> so it was an odd thing for me to do, but I don't know, it's something took me there. And, and uh, I c went into a room where they kept the uh, relics of the pyramid builders. It's very little. Uh, as, as you may know, very little has been found of the, 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 the great pyramid builders. And there was on the wall a picture, a photograph, a, a very large photograph, taken by the Egyptian Air Force in the 1950s, which showed a direct overhead of the three pyramids of Giza. And uh, I recall I, I had, a, in those days, I'm, I'm talking 1981 here, 82, I can't remember the exact day, where, you know, there was no internet, there, there was no fax. I mean, you know, the fax were being introduced then, you know, so a diff very different world. And it sounds strange for us to say, you know, I was surprised to see an aerial photograph, but you didn't see aerial photographs commonly in those days, you know, uh, let alone satellite photographs. So to me, it was a novelty. I mean, I'd never seen them from the air that way. And uh, I had an old well, now it's old, I had a, a nice Olympus camera with a black and white film in it, and I took a picture. And that was it, you know, I returned to Saudi Arabia, developed, and I had forgotten about it until I developed the film. And it just one, it was one of those things. I, mean, I was surprised that I, nobody had raised that question, like Newton's question. I, I saw three pyramids, two very large ones, they were on a clearly on a diagonal line. The, the, the base of the pyramid is a square, so you had two squares running along the diagonal. The third pyramid was much smaller, which in itself was intriguing, and offset to that line, to the to the to the east or left, left side. And that was it. You know, I asked the question: Why did they do that? I, the, the question that first nagged me was why the third pyramid was smaller. You know, all I had read about from Egyptologists was that these kings who built pyramids were megalomaniacs and they, they, they mobilized their country and they were, you know, so why would the third builder advertise a smaller pyramid? Because it's called the small pyramid. I mean, you know, it's diminutive. You know, people who go and see the pyramids of Giza, they say, oh, two big ones, one small. It's not small, it's 65 meters high. But if you put it next to these giants that are 140 meters plus, then it does look small. I, I, I give you, I, I'm, I'm thinking of an analogy. I mean, I'm a rather tall guy. I'm, I'm slightly over six feet. But I have my nephew who, believe it or not, is seven feet four. He's a basketball player. When I go next to him, I look small. I really look small. It's embarrassing. You know, I have pictures with him where he actually lifts me. So, why would a pharaoh want to advertise that he was smaller? He, you know, so the explanation for the Egyptologists is that they didn't have the resources. How did they know they didn't have the resources? He died early. That makes sense. How did he know he was going to die early when he started building his pyramid? Uh, and that kind of strange, it, it didn't make sense. And then I thought, how do you make it fit? I mean, how do you explain that there's a smaller pyramid there next to two big ones? And the only explanation came to mind was that it wasn't an ego problem. You know, it wasn't built by a pharaoh who had resources problems or he didn't have the, he was going to die early or whatever. It was a plan. It, it didn't belong to an individual pharaoh, it was an overall plan, which seemed to be the case. You had a, a site with three monuments of the same design, two almost of equal size and a smaller one. 
it, it reeks of a plan you know uh, so I thought okay that can explain it. It, it it's not a smaller pharaoh or a weaker pharaoh it's part of a plan and it had to be small the question is why did it have to be small the answer was obviously in what is the significance of this monument and that I agree uh, I agree with the Egyptologists There's no doubt at all that they are religious monuments but religious in the context of the builders and you have to get into the context of the builders now one of the strange things about the Giza pyramids is that they're there you know <laughs> they've been there for thousands of years but they're silent there is no inscriptions on them nor inside nor outside which in itself is another mystery the, the, the ego maniac pharaohs who build those pyramids didn't bother to tell us that they build them you know it's it's like I, I always say it's like me being a writer you know I, I, I mean I'm not an egomaniac but I get pretty upset if my publisher doesn't put my name on the cover you know it would, it would, it would upset me so why would they build the pyramid and the pharaoh would say well where is my name I mean, for posterity you know to, to you build this giant monument and nobody knows it's me you know so again this this story that i was hearing from the egyptologists did not fit although it's true that the pyramids of giza you now in, 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 to put them in a context that from the fourth dynasty which is dated roughly to about 2500 bc uh, the dynasty prior to, uh, sorry, the dynasty immediately to them, after them, the fifth dynasty, have built pyramids further south, a few kilometers further south. You can actually see them from here. But there's no question that when you see those fifth dynasty pyramids, it comes as a shock because you, you know, compared to the, to the massive and perfect fourth dynasty pyramids, these things are shoddy. You know, they're jerry building, I mean, they're really crumbling. I mean, some of them don't even look like pyramids. They're smaller, they're, they're built with, uh, in, they look like in haste, but they contain texts. In contrast to the fourth dynasty pyramids, these things are full of text. I mean, they, they, they filled every inch of the inner chambers with texts. Great. Let's see what they say. And these are known as the pyramid texts. Now, I should say this about the pyramid texts, they're authentic. They're actually carved on their original monuments. They're not translations or interpretations, they are the real thing. They're the oldest religious texts in the world, older than the Bible. Uh, strangely, they were, they, 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 they were greatly ignored. Egyptologists found them boring, they found them too complex and, and superstitious and they just didn't bother with them. Uh, to me, immediately, as I, well, I had to get a copy of them, it was not an easy thing in those days, I was still living in Saudi Arabia. And to me, the minute you read those texts, the minute you look into those texts, it's very obvious. They're entirely to do with the desire of the king to go to the sky, to ascend to the sky, after he dies. It's full of statements. Now, of course, they're 5,000 years old. They were not meant for uh, you and me to read. They were very occult. They were very um, private. Uh, they probably were not to be seen by other than the king himself and the high priests. And they were sealed inside the pyramid. So, you know, no wonder they're, they're complicated. But there are, you know, there is a logical way to approach them. Now, there's been very good translations of them. And, uh, today we, we have some excellent translations uh, since the 60s. They were discovered, by the way, in the 1880s. So prior to that, prior to that, Egyptologists would say the pyramids are mute, they don't speak, you know. Well, here they are, they were eloquently filled with, 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 with texts. And you can categorize them in, I've done this, I mean, what, what I did was take what I call direct statements. I mean, the king goes to the sky, that's no ambiguity, you know. The king wants to become a star, you know, and so I put the, what was direct statements, then what I call second level, third level, where it finally gets very obscure, because they use metaphors that we don't know what they mean. Now, as an example, because, you know, we accept metaphors for granted when we know them. I mean, when we read uh, the New Testament, for example, you know, we say the, 
the Lamb of God uh, gave his blood. So if you don't know who the Lamb of God is, you, you really don't get it. So, you know, you've got to realize that they do use metaphors like this in these ancient texts. And there's a point where you have to abandon it, you just can't get through. But there is no doubt that when you read those texts, the king wants to go to the stars. He wants to become a star. He wants to join his father in the sky. He, he, they believed that they were, kings believed that they were the sons of Isis and Osiris, the, the original founders of their civilization. And that Osiris, after his death, became a constellation, the constellation that we call today Orion. And there he created a kingdom, if you like, for the dead, for the kings. And the kings wanted to join him there. <laughs> Basically, uh, today we would say it's impossible, we would, you know, un unless we build a starship and, you know, whatever. They didn't think like we do. And that's where you have to spend a lot of time with these texts. Now, I'm jumping the gun here because I want to tell you how what happened that led me to look into all this deeply. Now I stumbled, after my return from Egypt, I'm sort of catching back the trip, I stumbled on a passage of these texts. Not a full translation, there was a friend of mine who had a coffee table book, and the luck of the gods would be that it mentioned the king wanting to go to the constellation of Orion. And it kind of stayed in my head. So I had this picture that I saw, you know, the pyramid, the little one offset, and then this statement. And on one occasion I was in the desert camping with, uh, with a group of friends and one of them, a French friend of mine, was a navigator. And that's again before the days of GPS and all this stuff. And he would use the stars. And he would, he explained to me, I mean, very bright sky on, on that particular night, and he said, you know, if you look at Orion, you see the central stars. Orion is like a rectangle, it's four bright stars. And in the middle is the famous belt, three stars. And he said, if you f draw a line backwards, you'll pick the position of the rising of Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere. Once you've got Sirius and you know it's bearing, that's it. You know where, where to direct yourself. And then, just like that, it's one of those, that's where the apple came. You know, he looked again at the stars and he was a bit apologetic. He said, you know, like, you know, I said they were in a row, but they're not in a row. There's the two bright ones are in a row and the little one on top is offset. And to me, he was saying the same thing that I was saying about the photograph of the pyramids. And knowing that there was a connection between the king's desire to go to the stars and the pyramids he built, no. The penny dropped, I mean, you know, the, the apple dropped on my head. I got very excited, but I mean, it wasn't... At first I thought, you know, somebody must have noticed this. I mean, it's one of those strange things, you know. I'm, I'm sure, that I'll waste my time, you know. So I wrote to a few Egyptologists, and it became very obvious that they had never heard of this. Uh, I finally stumbled on uh, the late Professor Edwards, Sir Ivan Edwards, who was very interested and he invited me to come and see him in, in, uh, when I had an opportunity to come to England, which I immediately thought, okay, why not? And the first holiday I had, I knocked on his door in, in Oxford, very sweet man, and he said, come in, you know, we talked about it. And he told me something that I didn't know. He told me that, indeed, the Egyptologists had known of a direct connection, not just with the texts, but with the pyramids of Giza, with the Great Pyramid that inside the king's chamber were shafts, narrow shafts, and one of them was, had been worked out by Egyptologists and astronomers to have pointed to Orion's belt at the time of the construction of the pyramids. And I thought, well, there you are. I mean, you know, what more do we want? You know, the and as I got more into this subject, I discovered something else which to me was utterly puzzling because the Egyptologists insisted that the kings who built those pyramids were following the sun cult, that they believed that the pyramids were solar symbols. 
that they represented the rays of the sun shining down or something like that or staircases leading to the sun but as you read the pyramid text it was very obvious that the king did not want to go to the sun the sun was the sun god he wanted to become a star there's no question about it on top of that not the Giza pyramids the, but there are pyramids of the same dynasty one at Abu Ruash built by the son of King Cheops of the Great Pyramid and one built by Pharaoh on the other side north just a few kilometers a fourth dynasty Pharaoh called Nebka and here it was the kings gave names to their pyramids they identified themselves with the pyramid they, 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 met, they saw themselves as themselves being part of the pyramid and they named the pyramid and they named them as a star the, the one in Abu Rawash is called Jelifra is a star and the one in, uh, in uh, Zawi Tararian is called Nebuchadnezzar is a star so what, what more do they want? the pyramids are identified as stars the king wants to go to the stars of Orion the, the, there is a shaft pointing to Orion's belt and the pyramid on the ground looks like Orion's belt I mean it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck it must be a duck and so I thought I'm going to publish this and uh, I did, I mean I eventually through contact with Professor Edwards I published a, uh, an article in uh, actually a series of articles in 1987 to 89 and that's it. I mean, I thought I've done my job, you know, I've, I've downloaded it from my mind and uh, let them do what they want to do with it. But I wasn't satisfied. I mean, uh, nothing really happened. Um, a couple of letters here and there, you know, but that was it. And I thought this is strange. I mean, this, this, this thing is too important. And you know, I, it sounds strange for me to say this now, but and I, I, I'm much older and I, I'm much more calmer about these things, but um, at the time, it's hard to explain, but I felt it was a kind of responsibility. I just could not accept that I'd die and I wouldn't have brought this thing out, you know, it just bothered me. And I had to do it, you know, I had to really push it. And so, well, long story, one thing led to another and eventually I, uh, I found myself a publisher. And by the luck of things, um, at the time when I was about to get started with writing this book for a publisher, uh, a German engineer, Rudolf Ganterbrick, explored the shafts uh, of the Great Pyramid. And uh, he found a little door, it's a famous little door at the end of one of these shafts. So there was big news about this and one, the whole thing took fire. Uh, it's, 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 to me it was one of those huge uh, 360 degrees situation. I mean, I, from one day to the next, I became, I became the star pyramid man, you know, <laughs> my life changed completely. Uh, I, I always remember this, I, the, the, the BBC did a, a major documentary on it. And I went the next day to London with my wife and we were visiting some friends and I stopped in Piccadilly Street and I wanted to buy some flowers and I, the, 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 the seller said oh you're the pyramid man <laughs> and I thought my god you know I mean, what have I done you know and it was overwhelming because uh, clearly I touched a nerve here uh, especially the way it was presented. I mean, of course, the BBC made it exposed it. Uh, I mean, suddenly, you know, it was broadcasted on on, on a major channel, and uh, everybody saw it. I mean, and who didn't see it were told about it. I mean, every Egyptologist in the country was on their on up in arms, you know. And suddenly, I found myself uh, overwhelmed by this. I mean. Uh, there was a lot of anger and uh, Egyptologists so and so in this newspaper saying I was a charlatan and you know it went out of control for a while but I kept my nerves because it's, it's very unnerving I mean you know you're getting attacked by some very senior people some some heavyweights you know professors and deans and all but then I thought wait a minute you know uh, makes sense <laughs> you know I don't care what they say you know, now I use very different approaches. I mean, uh, you know, they, they were the, the, the experts were commenting. 
you know, they were. And finally, I said, "Well, wait a minute. I'm the expert. I'm, I'm the expert on this one. You know, why should I be intimidated by the expert?" You know. And frankly, they, they were they were coming up with very annoying criticism. Uh, first, they did the uh, the personality thing. I mean, they, I, I wasn't an Egyptologist, and uh, I didn't know what I was talking about. And you know, he's a charlatan, and you know, uh, believe me, I was called a lot of things. And there were some instances where it got very nasty. I mean, in Egypt, I was called an anti a Jewish supporter, a Zionist, and here I was called an anti-Semitic for some reason. I don't know. It all went berserk. Uh, How did it end up having anything to do with the Jews? Well, here's the weird one, is that the pyramids, there, is a, there was an old theory that the pyramids were built by the Jews in captivity. Yeah. Now, if you supported the theory, you were a Zionist, according to the Egyptians. If you didn't support the theory, to some, you were anti-Semitic. But there you are, I mean, had people saying you're anti-Semitic, you know, you don't support them. It all came out because once you're exposed that way, you're, you're out there, you know, and anybody can take a pot shot at you. And in this case, the big guns came out. I mean, uh, it wasn't just uh, the lunatic fringe taking pot shots. I mean, I had, uh, you know, heavy weights. I mean, I had the, 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 the Ministry of Tourism in Egypt, the Director of the Antiquities, you know. And, but uh, things have, you know, I've, I've learned how to deal with this. You know, and the funny thing about this, I mean, I, I began to see, I mean, I was getting angry because I began to see that there was a kind of auto da fe here. I mean, the, the, not only they wanted my blood, but their arguments were, uh, were very um, almost inquisitional. I mean, uh, uh, strange arrogance that came out. I'm, I'm not saying in general. I mean, uh, there are some nice Egyptologists and some, but I was astounded. For example, this business about the door. You know, uh, there could be a chamber at the end of this shaft. Maybe there isn't, we don't know. But I had the German director of the German Archaeological Institute who was responsible for this exploration. And I remember sitting next to him with the BBC. And this man quite happily said, there is nothing behind this door. And I remember the BBC guy, you know, taking notes and so I give him a nudge, I said, ask him, how does he know? It didn't occur to him because it's funny how they don't, it doesn't occur to people to ask these authorities, they, they take them for granted. So I said, ask him how he knows there's nothing behind the door. And he said, why do you ask me? I said, well, I mean, how do you know there's nothing behind the door? And all he could say after getting green and red in the face was, because I am an expert. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm, I'm professor so-and-so. So I said, it's not good enough. So I began to see this kind of strange world that I thought academics were very broad-minded and liberal, but there was such a lot of backstabbing, a lot of um, uh, refusal when things were so obvious. So, you know, I use, I use phrases now like, you know, they can bring me a, a hundred Egyptologists if I'm concerned. You know, I, I tell them, it doesn't matter how many you bring. You know, truth is not democratic. You don't vote on truth, you know. If it's true, it's true, I'm sorry. You know, you can bring me a zillion professors. And that's, you know, and I, uh, there's a wonderful phrase by the, the Robert Schock, who also did a huge controversy over the age of the Sphinx. And he has a lovely one. I mean, he, he was once shouted at, during a, a geological conference. He was shouted down. And one geologist was very angry and he stood up and he said, there is not a single Egyptologist who agrees with you. You are not following the professionals. And you know what he said? He had a lovely reply. He said, I do not follow the Egyptologists. I follow the science. That's what I follow. And the science tells me that the Sphinx is older. I'm not going to follow the Egyptologists. And that's, he's right. And there's a kind of, kind of arrogance that you find at this high level. It, it's, it's very disconcerting, but you must hold your ground, and it's the way it goes. You know, I mean, we know history, you know, Galileo and all the Darwin, you know, they, they, they got their fair share of this. Do you think they get very jealous when, when people like yourself appear in, in the media? Yeah, I, you know, I don't even think it's jealousy. I think it's, they, they really truly begin to believe in their authority. And that's the danger. I mean, <coughs> 
you know, it's like the Pope, you know, <laughs> who believes in his authority. Yeah. You know, until you challenge his authority. I mean, how do you know, you know? He'll tell are you. There, are there any specific groups which have really taken what you've discovered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such as like well, Freemasons, for instance. Are they interested? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the public was widely interested in this, in, this, in this theory. It still is. I mean, it's a theory that uh, has become, <coughs> well, almost a household name. I mean, I'm surprised sometimes. I mean, uh, I was renewing my passport at the, the Belgian consulate a few days ago. And as I walked in, and you know, and they saw my name, they said, oh, you're, you're pyramid with Orion. Now, they said the Orion thing. Now, because, uh, yeah, there's a huge interest because it, it makes sense. I mean, uh, I know this by experience. I mean, I've been in the business for a long time with this theory. You know, give me 12 people, give me a jury, and I am sure that if you present them the case, as I present, it's very simple. You know, forget about Egyptology, forget about me. You know, let's look at the facts. And if you look at the facts, you will know that the pyramids, especially the Giza pyramids, are astronomically aligned. The, with high precision, they face the cardinal direction. So that alone should tell you that there is something to do with astronomy. The precision of the alignment is such that even the Egyptologists agree, you have to use stars. Can't do it with anything else. It has to be a pinpoint of light. Therefore, stars are related to the setting out of these monuments. And then you read that the king wants to go to the stars. And then you find that there is a shaft that pointed to the stars of Orion's belt. And the king wanted to go to specific stars. And then you look at the picture and you say, well, you know, three stars, three pyramids, two large pyramids, one offset, small one, two st stars, two bright ones, one smaller one offset. You've got a correlation. And then you say, wait a minute, also the way the pyramids are in connection with the Nile, in relation to the Nile, these are the same. They're inclined the same way, they're proportionally the same distance. We, we've got a correlation here. The question is not whether we got a correlation. The question is whether it is a coincidence. And the evidence that is back to... Well, if it is, it's one of those incredible things. You know, it's, uh, it, it just doesn't fit the coincidence. The, the needle is going into the no coincidence side. It's just one of those. And let me tell you, I mean, uh, I've been with this thing for 25 years. It's not a coincidence. And, and, and to ignore it is, is, is to me, uh, 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 well, of course, gradually as the dust began to, to, to fall and they got, you know, the anger began to dissipate, some Egyptologists began to look into this. And uh, some are open, some at least talk about it. It's been discussed at universities. Uh, where it's be taken the right direction is when archaeoastronomers began to look at this. Because frankly, Egyptologists are not the right guys to look at this. You need to, to know some basic astronomy. You know, you need to understand about precession, for example. You need to understand why the stars look the way they do today and why they change. And so that was a problem. Now, my problem was that when you talk to an astronomer, he said, I don't know anything about Egyptology, so I won't talk about it. And when you talk to an Egyptologist, he said, I don't know anything about astronomy, so I won't comment about it. So who's going to comment? You know, the angry guys were commenting. So eventually, we, there, there is now a profession. Uh, there, there are chairs at universities that blend the two. We call this archaeoastronomy. People who study archaeology and astronomy at the same time. Because why? It's not just the ancient Egyptians. All the ancient cultures looked at the sky and they have religions related to the sky. Their monuments are aligned to the sky. So you definitely need the input of astronomy. To, to me it was very obvious that the minute you brought in the missing key, if you like. The minute you brought astronomy into the equation, it worked. If you're looking at the pyramid text without astronomy, to me it was like looking at a, like looking at the balance sheet of, of an accountant and refusing to say there are numbers. You know, if you don't understand numbers, then the, you, how can you read the balance sheet?
there is a kind of problem in our culture. Uh, we have become uncomfortable with something that we should not be uncomfortable with. We, we're uncomfortable about the mystery of our existence. You know, scientists feel very uncomfortable with this. They felt uncomfortable discussing my theory, which is a very logical theory. We're not talking about aliens here, we're not talking about paranormal, we're talking about people who wanted to design a cemetery representing that sky zone that they wanted to go. There's nothing crazy about it. In their mind, they were doing something else, of course. In their mind, they were, they were building some sort of spiritual machine, if you like, that was going to launch them there. But there's nothing crazy about it. And yet, they refused. They felt very uncomfortable about this. So if they feel uncomfortable about this, forget about talking about you know, what we obviously all know we have. There is, there is a there is an unseen uh, aspect of our existence. You know, the, in fact, to be, uh, the way I see, at, at my age now, I realize that 90% of my existence is unseen. It's all going in here, somewhere. There is a mystery, there's a great mystery, and we're part of it. And we really don't know. I mean, the, the other day I was, uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I was invited to give a talk at the Theosophical Society. I'm kind of digressing here to, to answer your question because I went to, the, to give a talk at the Theosophical Society, I've got a very good friend, who you might be interested in, John Gordon. You know John Gordon? The writer, and tell you about him later. Anyway, John Gordon, who is, uh, organized these events, asked me to come and talk. I came from Spain, especially, to give a talk. And I decided to talk about the cosmology of the ancient Egyptians. <laughs> I remember I got an immediate reaction from a professional saying you shouldn't call it cosmology, you should call it cosmogony. And I said, why? He said, but because it's a religious, you know, it's a, a subtle difference. Anyway, so I went to give the talk. And I started talking science, you know, and uh, they, they, they felt a bit strange. I was supposed to talk about the ancient Egyptians. And I tried to put everything in a context in something like five minutes. I'll, I'll try and do it for you here because we tend to forget this. You know, I said, okay, here's what we know. You know, some 20 billion. And for four and a half billion years, we're not here yet. You know, we come at a very late stage. If you look at that context, you know, the existence of the human race is like that. And the existence of our scientific culture is, I can't even do the speed, I mean, it doesn't, I can't do it fast enough. That's what we are. And yet we think we can explain it. We can't explain nothing. You know, we, we have, sure, we have a technology, sure, we know how certain things work, but we have the three fundamental problems that the Egyptians had, that the cavemen had, and that we'll probably have God knows forever. You know, where do we come from? What are we supposed to do here? And where do we go after death? And we haven't answered these. These are the mystery. And the mystery should preoccupy us. And the Egyptians were preoccupied by the fundamental issues of our existence. We don't. You know, we, we're worried about our cell phone and what show we're going to see tonight, and we are embarrassed. That's the crazy thing. We're embarrassed when these questions are raised with scientists. They refuse to talk about this. They, they, they feel uncomfortable. Or they come up with even crazier ideas. You know, I, I don't know if you've talked to cosmologists. But I've, I've had a conversation with cosmologists and I thought he was mad. You know, because it doesn't, didn't make sense at all to me. Yeah. You know, suddenly the whole universe became a crazy place. I mean, he was honest enough. He said that between themselves, they call it crazy science. Yeah. It's totally crazy. So I said, I'd rather believe what the Egyptians believe. That <laughs> it seems to make some sense to me. The thing is that we have two errors here. One is that we are uncomfortable with what we think is the, you know, the wuji buji stuff, you know, the voodoo stuff. You know, but we shouldn't. We should. Feel, we should, on the contrary, we should feel at ease with this. The other is uh, the, the huge problem we have in our way of thinking is that we externalize the thinking. We think we're going to find the answers somewhere there. 
Now the funny thing is that we have the answer. You know, we, we, we come, we are actually made <coughs> from the original source. It's true, you know, you, 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 that fragment that blew up 20 billion years ago is somewhere in you. A piece of it is in you. We're it, you know. And we forgot to internalize our search. I mean, the, the, the ancient sages, you were talking about the great masters, they internalized. And, and, and the reason they did, luckily they didn't get born in our era because they would have been influenced and they wouldn't have done it. When you don't have a technology, when you don't have a scientific technology, but you have geniuses. You know, that's the funny thing about the, the when you study history and, and ancient history and prehistory, you know, it's very annoying when you read that they were supposed to be primitives. There is no reason why they, there wasn't Einsteins and Newtons and geniuses. They were, but they didn't have the scientific technology. They had the same brain. And they use that brain to internalize. They try to explain somehow their existence by searching inside. And for all we know, they probably arrive closer to the answers than we will with all our technology. So, to answer your question in a roundabout way, yes, I believe in the mystery and I believe that for some reason uh, I saw this thing. What it means in the greater scheme of things, I don't know. But uh, I, I, feel, I feel pretty blessed that for some reason I was given something to expose, to bring out. And, and if it's true, then it's wonderful because it's one of those things that changes completely our perception about what our ancestors were doing. Completely. I mean, we, 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 we see them in a very different light here. What I'm looking at now uh, is I'm, 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 I'm looking at prehistory and I'm going to beyond the ancient Egyptian civilization. The, 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 there's one thing that was intriguing by the statements made in the pyramid text. They not only spoke about the king going to the stars of Orion to join Osiris, and so, but they spoke as if it was happening in a context of time, which they call the first time. It's as if the king believed that he was going to return to the point of origin, where it all started, and join, rejoin his clan of gods. You know. And I thought, wait a minute, what do you mean by this first time? He kept talking about a long time before when the god Osiris had established. And I thought, wait a minute, if they, if they speak of Osiris as being the stars, what would be the first time of these stars? And of course, it brought me to this idea of precession. There is a cycle of 26,000 years. What would constitute the beginning of such a cycle? And as you observe these stars, over that long-term cycle, we can do that with a computer. Uh, the, the, what seems obviously the beginning is when they're at their low, uh, at their, at their uh, nadir, if you like. And then they rise to the maximum and then they drop again on this cycle. So I thought, let's look at the beginning. Do they mean something? And I was stunned because as you brought them down, if you like, if you process the stars to the beginning, you arrived at a very strange date. You arrived at the date of 10,500 BC and all the bells began to ring here because there was the strange prophecies made by the, 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 the American seer, the other case in which I was, I'm not into that at all, but I thought how weird, I mean, you know, he, he, he guessed it, you know. And then I thought, wait a minute, why, let's look carefully at the sky. And I remember it's, the, the software is such that I was looking due south, I was looking at the, the way the stars moved up and down in this cycle, and the software is such that if you press E you go east, if you press W you go west, and 
So for some reason I pressed E and said, let's, let's see what happens east. And there it was, you know, floating over the east, precisely due east, was the constellation of Leo. Now I didn't need to be told anything because I knew that there was a monument that was a lion looking in that direction. And I thought this is too much, I mean it can't be, I mean it's, it's, it's very odd. I mean now we have two monuments, <coughs> two sets of monuments, the three pyramids, like Orion in the south and the Sphinx like Leo in the east, locking at the same time. So I phoned Graham Hancock, I said, you know, have a look at this. And uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll go to the grave on this one because it caused a hell of a lot of commotion. Because the Orion mystery already was causing a fuss, but at least it was within the dating that the Egyptian, the Egyptologists gave. But now when we started talking about 10,500 BC, they were not happy at all. But you see, the reason they were not happy is they couldn't simply poo-poo it. You know, the logic was, was incredibly clear here. You know, the Egyptians invite us to look at Orion, we look at Orion and then they invite us to look at the beginning of a cycle, we look at the beginning of a cycle and bang, look what you've got. So it's pure logic. You know, there was nice, clear, straightforward logic. Of course, all the arguments, they didn't know Leo at the time and all this stuff, and, but it was there. And you see, <laughs> I don't see it like that too much nowadays, but uh, what was going on was suddenly we began to form a camp. You know, we were the alternative, you know, called an alternative historian. And they were the orthodox. And we realized we were battling. You know, we were. They, they were, they were, and, and we began to realize why they were angry, especially with me and Graham Hancock. They were angry because our arguments were solid. Otherwise they wouldn't even bother. You know, and, and that's what got them angry, is that people would say, well, why do you say they're wrong? I mean, look at the logic, you know. So they got very, very angry and they just could not knock it. So they, they at, at, at one stage we had them on, on the run, I can tell you. They were, until they sort of regrouped again <laughs> and then they became nasty you know they would go and fish around experts you know and, and then they would have professor so and so saying you know i've looked at this and this is rubbish you know but um, it was a strange situation so so you're kind of pointing out the strings are either built in well again, again well to answer your question is yeah we we we, uh, we wrote another book and we wrote a book called Keeper of Genesis, which was all about this idea that there was a correlation. If you reconstructed the sky at what you could interpret as the first time that the Egyptians spoke of in the text, this first time of Orion or Osiris, then you had a Cinderella fit. You know, the, the, the slipper fitted, this pyramid slipper fitted perfectly. And it, to me, it's just one of those. I mean, uh, that's it. I mean, so they said, well, how do you explain this? I mean, you know, okay, it, okay, we see it, but there was no Egyptians in 10,000 years ago. You know, there was, you know, there's no evidence of a culture. There's no evidence. Where, where, where are the pot shards? Where are, where are the, where are the monuments? You know, where? so it's true. There was no evidence, and for a while it was a theory. For a long time it was a theory, until. Now, <laughs> and then everything is changing now because the evidence is coming out strong, hard, solid, stone evidence. And in a place where we didn't expect it at all, where I wasn't looking at all. And that is the Egyptian Sahara, the western desert of Egypt. One has to see this thing in its chronological events. I mean, th th there, was, there was theories. There was a theory about the correlation, which was astronomy. There was a theory about the correlation bringing the Sphinx in, the dating. And then there was the geological arguments brought by Robert Schock, John West. Uh, but uh, although they caused one hell of a commotion, they caused a lot of discussion, a lot of anger. Uh, 
what was always the weak point for the uh, orthodoxy was okay they're very nice theories but where is the evidence I mean we want to see and uh, it was annoying you know and of course we said but it's not a problem I mean you know we, we, everything suggests that there was activity going on in this remote period you know 10,000 BC 12,000 BC it's not our job to look at the evidence you know, they're evidence-driven, they're, 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 they're evidence and the evidence in archaeology has to be... Now we were using a different word, by the way. It has become more and more accepted in, in, in archaeological circles to talk about non-tangible evidence. Because there are, there's a lot of evidence that is very convincing, but it's not, you can't touch it. You know, you can't touch astronomy. You know, but it exists. You can't touch religion, you know, but it exists. So it became very annoying with the archaeologists that they would insist on tangible evidence. Because that's how they do it. You know, they, they, they dig on the floor and if they find something and if they don't, it's not there. So now, it's, it's, it's a new term by the way, it's being used quite a lot in archaeology. We talk about non-tangible evidence. For example, if there are two monuments of different dates, but they exhibit the same alignments, astronomical alignments, uh, to the same stars and so forth, then there is a link. It's not tangible, you know, you, you, you don't find the artifacts, but the link is obvious. And therefore, a, a lot of blockage used to happen because they would not consider this evidence, so we couldn't move. You know, but well now they, 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 we tend to move, because you've got to move once you find something that is leading the argument in a direction. So, <clears throat> the evidence was non-tangible. It was a good theories, it made a lot of sense, but they could not find this evidence. And it became very annoying. Every time there was a discussion, where is it? You know. Until, until 1974. Now, strangely, our arguments were heated up in the, in the 90s. But we hadn't heard of this. It hadn't become clear. Anthropologists from America and from Poland stumbled on a prehistoric site in the Sahara. There was a lot of these prehistoric sites, I mean, the Sahara is full of them. But they stumbled on a very weird one, a hundred kilometers west of Abu Simbel. Uh, they named it the Napta Playa. What was strange about this site is that it seemed to be not a usual settlement that they used to find, you know, just remains of stone huts and, 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 and flints and, and stone articles. What was strange about the site is that it didn't have anything of, the, it had some of this stuff, but the main stuff that it had was large boulders in strange patterns. It looked like some sort of ceremonial site. The, the, the centerpiece of this is, is a stone circle. Uh, we call it the, the, the sort of Stonehenge of the desert. Uh, it operates like a can. And they found it almost intact. The strange thing about this site is that the people who were there just left it. And it was untouched for thousands of years. We know for sure that it <coughs> existed in long, long before the pyramids because of the carbon dating that has been done. We know that the people who were there, whoever they were, were there from about 8 to 9,000 BC. And they remained there till about 3,500 BC. It's a huge period of time. There is three main elements in this site. Uh, one of them is the stone circle. I want to see it many times. It's not very big. It's about the size of this room. The stones are about this height. And <coughs> it's, it's amazing. You, you're looking at something that was put there about seven, eight thousand years ago. Then there are strange conglomeration of rocks, clearly placed by human hands, they're not natural. One of them is a, obviously the main one, it's a, it's a much larger conglomeration, and from it shoots out alignments of stones, like spokes of a, of a bicycle wheel. You know? Several of them shoot north, Several of them shoot east. Egyptologists didn't pay much attention to this. I mean, they, 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 they studied it like a normal 
prehistoric side. They started digging, they started studying the, the, the flints and all this business. Until one of them said, well, you know, what do they mean all this stuff? And they had a hunch, it's something to do with the horizon. And of course they knew that <coughs> the Egyptians of later times practiced this kind of rituals. So they brought an astronomer on the site, a fellow called Kim Malville from Boulder, Colorado. And he immediately noticed, you know, it didn't take him long to realize that there was alignments to the solstices from the stone circle, alignments to the meridian. But it got very intriguing when he looked at the alignments of these spokes, these long rows, they, they go about five, six hundred meters. He concluded, and here's the weird one, he concluded that the alignments in the east pointed to Orion's belt and to Sirius, and he concluded that the alignments in the north pointed to the plow. These are the three constellations that the pyramid builders used. And suddenly there was a shockwave. You know, it's a bit like the um, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, the, w w you know, suddenly we had a shock because what we thought was original to the, the, to the Old Testament, to the New Testament, was not. And there was phrases verbatim from previous times. So there we were, I mean, the, you know, weird. What was even weirder is that there's a third element on this site which are tumuli, large igloo-shaped uh, conglomeration stones, and when they started digging these, in some of them, they found buried the remains of cows. And they were clearly ceremonial. There were cows positioned uh, to face all the same direction. There was a few beads around them. They buried cows. Clearly, and, yeah, it's very strange. What became even stranger is when they start digging some other of these stimuli, and they didn't find cows. They found even stranger thing. They found that these people, whoever they were, buried huge boulders single piece boulders, about three, four tons a piece. They went to the trouble of dragging these boulders from a long distance, they would dig a hole about six meters deep, and they would cover it. They were totally baffled, I mean, they were totally baffled. Clearly it was cer ceremonial. But the, the ceremonies were astronomical. Literally looking at the stars and the sun, and the very same stars, you know, Orion's belt, Sirius, and the plow. Better still, they had been there for thousands of years, and the astronomer Malvel concluded they weren't just watching the stars, they were tracking them, because the lines changed direction as the stars moved with precession. These people were doing precession, <laughs> and observing precession, and tracking it for thousands of years before the pharaohs. So there was something else. And what were the cows doing there? You know, we thought cows were not domesticated, they were domesticated in Asia. These guys had cows. And clearly they had domesticated their cows. Now here's the story of what we know now. In prehistoric times, we're talking about 20, 30,000 years ago, the Sahara was fertile. It had, it had periods of aridity and periods of fertility. When it was fertile, the reason it was fertile is because of the climatic <coughs> conditions, especially before the Ice Age. As the Ice Age began to break, caused tremendous weather shifts and in Central Africa the monsoons that still happen today were very violent and they would cause this, they still do, they cause the Nile flood every year, you know that the Nile floods every year in, 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 in summertime. But the floods were gigantic, nobody could live in the Nile Valley, I mean it was, it was, a, it was a swamp and, and dangerous, you know, these floods would come and wreck everything. Whereas the opposite was in the Sahara, because the monsoon would push their way northwards and they would reach the southern parts of Egypt. They would pass Sudan and, and rain where today is Abu Simbel and these kind of places, which there's no rain today. And what, they would, what would happen is that during a two or three weeks period, they would drench the Sahara. And in the depressions, of course, they would form temporary lakes. This beautiful pastoral field, you know. Now, because of that, the nomads of the area, now we don't know where they came from, but there's a very strong case now that they came from the Tibesti Mountains in the, in the Chad, a long, long time ago. They were black people, they, were, they, they looked like Maasai, it's very, very slender, very beautiful black people. We don't know when they came, maybe 20, 30,000 years ago. Something drove them 
into what is today the Sahara. And they settled in certain regions and they would hunt like they except when the aridity of the desert began to form in these periods of aridity they were forced to move because water was scarce and when their lakes would dry they would try and find lakes that still had water so they were obliged to move and now we all agree, I mean the anthropologists agree, even Egyptologists are forced to agree <coughs> because they were forced to move they had to find a way how to navigate not only that they had to carry their food. Distances are enormous. And that forced them, rather than to hunt, to somehow find a way to take their beasts. And they began to domesticate animals. Cows, uh, goats. So they would literally have walking fridges, if you like, walking larders. And they would, they would not kill these animals. They would drink the milk, they would drink the blood, like the Maasai do. In fact, we still have remnants of these people who are still pastoralists. But these pastoralists that still exist in Africa stayed pastoralists. Whereas the ones in the Sahara, because they were forced to do certain things, they were forced to move and therefore they were forced to domesticate cattle very early and they were forced to learn about the stars, to navigate. Like we were forced to learn about the stars when we navigated before the, the invention of the clock and before the invention of radars. We were literally forced to do that, otherwise you get lost. So they began to study the sky and that led them to not only to move, to navigate, but they had to time the navigation. They had to, the, the, when you travel in the Sahara today, you, it's not so obvious to people who haven't done it, but the most vital thing is when you get to where you want to get, that you find water there. If you don't find water in serious trouble unless you've carried it you can't take the risk of going somewhere at a well, and if the well is dry, you've had it. And in those days, they would travel for months, weeks. The danger was that they didn't want to get... To so they had to know when the rains were coming. And they began to realize that if they studied the sky, they could time the seasons, they could time the dates with the stars, and they developed calendars. They even developed what today what they call primitive waypoints, JPSs. They, 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 they knew where they were, by <coughs> literally looking at the stars, like we did with sextants. You know, the, the. So here we are, we have a people who were navigating the desert, who finally, finally found themselves at this Napta Playa, only a hundred kilometers from the Nile, six, seven thousand years before the Pharaoh, stayed there, and the reason they stayed there is that suddenly it clicked to them that they didn't have to move. They began to dig deep wells, and they stayed. So in the dry season, they would have water from the wells, and then the rain would come and replenish. So they stayed for thousands of years. And their, their, their navigation and astronomy became more religious. They still practiced the astronomy, they became more and more religious. Hence, why well, there's all these strange ceremonial sites. So here we have the roots of a complex culture who knew about, who knew about to move stones, who had domesticated cattle, who were practicing basic uh, agriculture, we found cereal growth, thousands of years before the pharaohs appeared. Now, the climate changes again. The desert becomes more and more arid, and the Nile becomes more and more habitable. The floods become gentle, and these people literally were forced to move. They had to move out of the Sahara. And the obvious place they went is the Nile but they brought with them this cargo of knowledge and they injected this to whoever was there, maybe simple hunter-gatherers, fishermen, we don't know, and they injected them with this knowledge that's kick-started, if you like, the pharaonic civilization. It is from the desert that leads to the pyramids. What is emerging from there is that the, one of the strange things about culture is that anthropologists are beginning to realize that culture isn't something that people sit down and say we're going to decide to build houses. And culture comes from being forced to have to change. And what forces human beings to change, certainly in those prehistoric times, was the weather, you know, where there was water, where there was grass to feed their, their, their animals. 
So the weather, in a sense, the climatic changes forced people to do something. In this case, it forced them to become wise, if you like. The, the only way to survive is to become wise men. And they did that. So uh, here there, these people who lived for thousands of years, observing the stars, developing rituals, burying cows, uh, doing all sorts of uh, complex things, and they find themselves forced again to go in the Nile Valley. Now the interesting thing is that all their calendrical activity was based on the monsoons. Now it is the monsoons who also caused the Nile flood. So they went there with a ready-made hydrology, if you like. They, they knew exactly what to do and to predict the floods. So that clearly injected a, um, uh, the, 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 the seed that sprouted very quickly. There is a huge consensus here. I mean, there is m most anthropologists now and most senior Egyptologists are accepting that there was a mistake, that the origins of the pharaoh, there was two theories, that either they came from the Asiatic and Levant side, yeah. and Mediterranean, or that they sprouted themselves. I mean, it just happened. Well, now the evidence is pointing entirely in a different direction. It's pointing to the west, to the sub-Saharan region, and even further, we think that the people that we're talking about came from probably the Chad and these areas. Now, the reason is that these areas were very, very inviting for human beings. You know, the the Tibesti Mountains are superb places for human beings to flourish, whereas the other places were very agitated. So, the whole picture is changing. There is a bias, of course. There is a bias because there is established theories, there is established books, and the big bias is going to come from probably those who have a difficulty in, 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 in stomaching the idea that civilization, the roots of civilization is from a black people from the sub-Saharan. You know, and, and uh, we've suspected this for a long time. Uh, but there is a problem, there's an ethic problem here. The Egyptians, uh, the historians have a problem. We, we, we attribute all our knowledge to the Greeks. We attribute our knowledge to some sort of um, Greek super invention. You know, whereas we know the Egyptians had architecture, astronomy, and mathematics before them, and now we know that the sub-Saharan people had this before them. So, the whole picture is changing. The, the, it's, it's a very, very exciting thing. Now, the weird thing is this, is that, did the Egyptians know that they remember this origin? Now, the funny thing is that when you read the Egyptian texts, you know, it's, it's obvious that they are speaking of some ancestors who came from these western regions. What is more interesting is that now, now we have, uh, I'll tell you this because it's, it, it, cl it closes the whole discussion here, is in the very far southwest of Egypt, uh, if you look at the map of Egypt, if you go way south, you hit the Sudanese borders just past Abu Simbel. If you go way west, you hit the Libyan borders. Where the corners meet, in the extreme southwest, is the most bizarre, mysterious place you can imagine. And the funniest thing is that it was not discovered till the 1920s. The reason is, is that it's so remote that until the 1920s, when they could go there with motorized vehicles and biplanes, you couldn't get there. I mean, it's kind of incredible that, now let me describe this. There is two mountain ranges, one called Gilfi Kibir, which is the size of Switzerland. So if you can imagine Switzerland without trees, it's, it's literally a huge mountain range. How, how? We didn't know it was there. And then a bit further up is even more mysterious, smaller mountain range called Jebel Uwainat. Uh, a lot of people will, will click to the air to this place because when, I don't know if you remember the film The English Patient and she dies in a cave. It was supposed to be in a Kibir. She dies in the so-called cave of swimmers. It does exist. There's a cave of swimmers. Now the, the, it's the most arid place in the world. I've been there. It takes you six days of four-wheel drive in the open desert to get there from Cairo. I can tell you it's one heck of a trip. It's a thousand kilometers from Cairo and it's 500 kilometers from the nearest point, the, the last oasis. The last oasis is Dakhla. It's one big trip, even with four-wheel drives, you don't want to do it without proper guides, with proper equipment. Therefore, the, now when, you, when it was discovered in the 1920s, 
apart from this magnificent, strange rocks and things, they found a purification of prehistoric artifacts and drawings, uh, caves full of these drawings. And clearly the people who <laughs> drew themselves were not that primitive. They're, they're black people, they, 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 they have clearly domesticated cattle, they have ranchers, they even have houses. You know. So, we now can see the people. We can see these people who probably came to Napta Playa and probably are the original Egyptians. The Egyptologists, until last year, did not want to consider the link. The reason is that they were utterly convinced that nobody could get there, the pharaohs could not get there, these people could not come over. So, okay, it's, it's a nice idea, but they can't come. I'll tell you why, because there's 700 kilometers of arid desert. You have to find a way to travel 700 kilometers carrying your water. It can't be done. You can't take camels, you can't take donkeys. The, the, the water you need to carry cannot be carried by these animals. It's too heavy. It can't be done. It's impossible. It's impossible. There was no... Until... Until... Two years ago. Two things happened. There's a German... Uh, amazing guy, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, a fellow called Carlo Bergman. We describe him as a sort of modern nomad. He dropped everything about 20 years ago and he decided to become a desert explorer. He was working for the Ford company in, uh, in Munich. Dropped everything. He bought camels and he went to explore the desert. Uh, of course he was used by the various institutes, you know, uh, to do some research for them. And he found what is known as the Abu Balas Trail. He found a trail that leads from the last oasis to this distant zone. And what he found was that at every interval there was water stations, like fuel stations. The, the, the ancient Egyptians built these water stations. And the reason it's called Abu Balas, Balas in Arabic means jars. They put these giant jars and they fill them with water. So they would do them in steps. So we know they got there. But even then the Egyptian, the Egyptians said, no, 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 they, they probably tried to get there, but they couldn't make it until last year. And I was directly involved with it. Uh, two friends of mine, Mark Bord and Mahmoud Marai. Uh, these are people I encouraged, uh, certainly Marai, I've helped him a lot. Decided to go to this distant place, Jebel Wailat, and have a good look. And they were trying to find more of these rock art drawings. But what they found was stunning. They found pharaonic inscriptions. There's no questions, the pharaohs went there. So the pharaohs went to the place where they probably started from, so they knew their origins. You know, we're realizing that there was a prehistoric culture all over the place. Megalithic prehistoric culture. I mean, you find these stone monuments all over the place. I mean, here in England, it's full of them. France, the, uh, Spain, uh, the, the, all the islands of the Mediterranean, uh, Malta, Sicily, uh, Sardinia, uh, Mallorca. There was a large prehistoric culture. Uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, we don't have a name for it, so we call it the Megalithic culture. Mm -hmm. They did the same thing. They did the same thing. They're all aligning their monuments, they're all developed calendars, they're all... We're even finding links between them. So, we've got the wrong picture about our origins. And we've got the wrong picture where it started. There is no question in my mind that it started in that sub-Saharan area. I mean, not just me, I mean, we're talking about many people involved with this. Uh, it's emerging everywhere. I mean, Botswana, like you say, uh, Turkey, it's coming out. There is a huge error that has been made, partly because of the obstinacy of, of, of archaeologists, uh, partly because they simply did not look at the right tools, they need to use astronomy, they need to use certain tools that we use now. We've got satellites, we've got GPSs, we, know we, we can move very fast here. You know, the funny thing about looking at the evidence, that's why I like astronomy. You know, an alignment is an alignment. You know, you find the pot chart and they'll argue for years, you know, is it this dynasty, it's not this dynasty, and who did it, and what it's made of, and who did not do it, and why was it not, and they will write articles. You find an alignment and there is no argument. You know, it's 26 degrees pointing there, that's it. <clears throat> there's no argument, there's no ifs and buts. So they're not used to this. They love 
hazy stuff. They're used to arguments about, you know, did they mean this in the text? Does this um, artifact represent a tool or is it a cooking utensil? They're gone forever. But with astronomy, an alignment is an alignment. You know, it's a bit like, uh, I don't care how many people you want to argue with me. I can show you it's aligned to the summer solstice. Full stop. There's no ifs and buts. It helps you date things as well, doesn't it? It helps us date. The tool of astronomy not helps us date, but it helps us... We can speak a language. It's a common language that we have with these prehistoric people. They looked at the same sky. They arrived at the same rough conclusion that we arrived at. They, 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 they could see the cycles. Do you think that, that ancient man also humanized the skies? Or? Ancient man did something better than we do. And, and we're, we're making a terrible mistake. You know, we, we, we are in a cosmic environment. But, we, we, you know, you go out there and nobody sees it that way at all. You know, they, they, they think their environment is, is Bletchley and Luton. No, they are in a cosmic environment. And ancient man was very aware of this because he lived in the wide open. And to him the mystery was there. You know, by demystifying things, we think we're learning, we're not. Because we're not using our brain in the manner that it is meant to be used, to, to work out things from the inside. You know, it's, we think that they were, they were they're superstitious because they thought that the stars represented... The, but the fine thing is that they were making more sense by saying that there is life out there. Because there is life out there. You, know, you will have astronomers, astrophysicists, you know, when 15 years ago they would go blue in the face when somebody suggested there might have been life outside our solar system. They, 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 they hated this. I mean, they thought you were, you were polluting the human race by suggesting this. Well, now they're, they're okay with this because we cannot deny that in this vast cosmological environment we are, it doesn't make sense that, you know, we're, we're only us. So the, the whole picture is changing. And we'll be, I'm beginning to realize that ancient man was as intelligent as we are. The, the only thing is that he approached his mystery. He, he attempted to explain them in a, what we would call a metaphysical way. Well, I'm beginning to think that they might have you know, if you're uncomfortable with that, well, that's too bad, because that's what we are. And we need to wake up again. One more important thing is that to make a, a faster mobile phone. You know, we need to look into what is important to us as human creatures that are spiritual. You know, what, this is what matters. So, there is a shift going on. You know, one senses it. It's a small movement, but it's gaining momentum. There is anger by... by by, the, by, by some people in the general public. They're angry because they don't understand science anymore. They don't understand... I mean, the reminder of the moon landing, for example. You know, we're blasé about it. You know, we, 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 we spent fortunes going to look at a bit of dust. You know, uh, we're doing the wrong thing. And, and the more we're going to go, the more we're not going to understand. It's not the way to understand who we are. We've got to internalize and look at ourselves spiritually. And this is a mistake that our culture is hopefully going to wake up to. And maybe by studying these prehistoric people, it's not just because we're finding that they knew astronomy this, is that they remind us when human beings were uh, in harmony with nature, that they, they were part of it rather than observers, rather than passers-by. You know? They were integrated with the machinery of the cycles of nature. And, and, and then developed religious systems based on that. The religion of the ancient Egyptians, for example. It's a beautiful, natural religion. They, they, everything was sacred to them. They, 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 they looked at the stars, they looked at the, uh, at the vegetation, they looked at the animals. You know, it was an, an, a religion that was the closest that we ever had to nature. It, 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 it felt good. <laughs> <laughs> they survived for 3,000 years until we brought our own man-made religion, which didn't make sense at all, and look what happened to Egypt, you know?